included. Uh, would you be comfortable with us just doing a, like a half circle or something? Uh, I'm very happy with you just wherever you are. Right. You're fine. That's fine. <laughs> but see, I'm, all of a sudden, when did that go on? Yeah, Don John. <laughs> okay. It probably hurts some folks. There's got to be something. I, this is all so above my head. Good morning. I am um, sub subbing this morning. And um, at, I hope that I have something worthwhile to say because I didn't have much time to put it together. But Gordon asked me, apparently you've, he's been moderating for the last month, and he's been talking about poetry and the Bible. And he couldn't be here this morning because he, um, he's not feeling very well. But he uh, found a, he, he cites uh, for, Portrait in the Bible, he cites three things. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Psalm 137, 1 through 3, and Psalm 12. So, and he also handed me a poem by Maya Angelou called Cage Bird. I feel, he said that he felt that this poem speaks to so much of what we have been enduring the past two weeks. It talks about racism and captivity. And he said it made him think of Buffalo and of Texas. And so I'm, this is from Gordon to you all. A free bird leaps and the back of the wind and floats downstream till the current ends and dips his wing in the orange sun rays and dares to claim the sky. But a bird that stalks down his narrow cage can seldom see through bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill, but the caged bird sings of freedom. Free bird thinks of another breeze and the trade wind soft to the sighing trees, and the fat worms waiting on a dawn bright lawn, and he names the sky his own. The caged bird stands on the grave of dreams, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream, his wings are clipped and his feet are tied, so he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still. This tune is heard on the distant hill where the caged bird sings of freedom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this has been a week, two weeks, of great, great sorrow, great anguish for all of us. We pray, we pray for those who have died so terribly and so unjustly and so young, some of them, we pray for their families and their communities. We pray for us, Lord, that we live in this world and in this place where these things can happen. We know, Lord, that you are in charge, and that you do look after us, and that in the end we can trust in your endless compassion, your endless mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, today you are... We're ending a study of freedom, which is um, the caged bird and the, and the, and the free bird. Um, and we end with uh, the book of Galatians, uh, the last part of Galatians. And I want to talk a little bit about Galatians. I, if, you may have heard all this before, but um, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it helped me ground when I was getting ready for this, wet, this lesson. Galatians is, there's a great deal of controversy among scholars as to when it was written and to whom it was written. But the general consensus seems to be that it was written um, to, a, the people, to a people who lived in a Roman province of Galatia. And of course, my maps have disappeared. Um, but the, it was a province that stretched almost up from the Aegean Sea, almost up to the Black Sea. And it was a big province, but not very, it was sparsely settled. And there were very few Jews there. And it, Paul and Silas went there um, on their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. And, um, and 
true to their their usual habit, they went. They tried to find a synagogue in the first city they visited. Well, there wasn't a synagogue, um, and they. But at any rate, in their preaching to Gentiles, primarily they were preaching to Gentiles. In their preaching to Gentiles, they opened a can of worms and met and encountered and caused the first major crisis of the new church. Clearly, and Galatians, many scholars feel, was the first of Paul's, the first letter, the earliest letter that we have of Paul. He is addressing the problem raised by the Judaizers of who, what do non-Jews have to do to become Christians? And he's doing it quite bluntly, which makes scholars feel that this letter was written before the big the Jewish conference where the decision was made that circumcision would not be required of non-Jews. So this is being written to um, a population primarily Gentile, but also to the Judaizers, those who felt that to become a Christian, one had to first become a Jew and to uh, subscribe to the law and to live um, as Torah directed. And what Paul is saying, and I also want you to remember, this was the book that opened Martin Luther's eyes. Um, as, as we've talked about so many times, during the, it, with the early church and lay, as we went into the what we're going to now call the Dark Ages. They weren't really that dark, but um, and into into the time of the early Catholic Church, the letters of Paul were almost forgotten. Um, all the concentration was on the Gospels. Now, only the Gospels were read in church. The, the The Pauline epistles were just gone, and for Luther, when he discovered them. It was just an eye-opening experience because it was a whole new way of looking at the, the teachings of Jesus. And what Paul says, in effect, is, of course, the famous Christians, to be a Christian, the requirement is that you get into a relationship with God. He calls it, Paul refers to it as justification. And that you enter into this relationship with God, there is no other requirement. So that to say that to be a, to, to follow the law, say that you must be circumcised, to say that uh, you must um, follow certain dietary rules, that you must um, live your life in a very in a very organized way. Paul is saying in effect that if you do that, you almost. It, 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 it's it's you almost become to worship the law rather than God because you're so concentrated and bec you become very outwardly pious oh look at me I follow the law exactly but in a relationship with God he accepts you no matter who you are no matter what you are and what you've done or what you haven't done and your relationship is one of the spirit and not one of the flesh. Of course, this justification by faith, and the just shall live by faith alone. For Luther, was he was looking at the, uh, the corruption of the, uh, of the Catholic Church of that day. And he was looking at people literally trying to buy their way into heaven. And, and you know, there were... Um, uh, priests going around uh, raising money constantly, and the and the famous saying was, when the when the when the silver in the salver rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Luther reads all of this, but you cannot buy your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into heaven. Nothing you do is going to get you into heaven. It's all the relationship that you have with God, and it's the grace of God that's going to get you into heaven. And so the freedom of this is that you are freed from the law. You are free now. Of course, Luther is not saying that you know you can go out and run amok, but and neither is Paul. But you are free to enter into a true relationship with your Savior, with Jesus Christ. Um, Paul was very, and Paul Paul acknowledges. Uh, and this week, it's it's so true. 
Paul acknowledges the existence of evil and bad things on earth. Jesus' death was a bad thing, except that Paul says it was a planned thing. God planned for Jesus to die that way, and he used men as his instruments to bring about that death and that resurrection. Paul is beginning to address Gentiles, and he's talking to people who literally have never heard of Jewish law or Jewish faith or Jewish customs. And quite frankly, um, initially Peter is supportive of him in this, and, and actually um, apparently at some point comes to Galatia and, and preaches with Paul. But then there gets to be such a to-do in the church in Jerusalem uh, about we're bringing in these people who are not worthy to be brought in, that there's a major crisis in the church which will eventually be uh, as to who can be a Christian. That uh, this will only be resolved by this Jerusalem conference, but significantly this is the beginning of church, the Christian church, begins to reach out primarily to Gentiles. So that eventually almost everyone uh, in, the, in the Christian church has no Jewish background. But fortunately chose to maintain the relationship with the Old Testament. Think how poor we would be without that. So Paul is talking of freedom from the law freedom to enter into a relationship with God. And he begins to talk about two different ways of living. That when you are, have this freedom and this relationship, you can live in the spirit or you can live in the flesh. And he says, say be guided by the spirit. And you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the spirit, and the spirit is set against one's selfish desires. Think about that. A person's selfish desires are set against the spirit, and the spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They don't. They can't come together. They are opposed to each other. So you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. You shouldn't do whatever you want to do. This is not He's saying... This relationship with God, this life in the Spirit, is not a license to kill. It's not a free reign to go out and just do. The Spirit becomes the guiding, the guiding factor in your life. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious, since they include, and now he gives us a list of that, and listen, they're all things that are still with us today. Nothing much has changed under the sun, really. Um, they include sexual immorality, moral corruption, doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I wonder what Paul would define as partying. Um, he says, I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do these kinds of things won't inherit God's kingdom. So being free from the law is, again, you must enter into a life where you yourself choose. It's not what the law tells you to do. It's what you yourself choose to do, living with the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with its passions and its desires. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self, the flesh, with its passions and its desires. 
if we could achieve that's it's it's a, it's a wonderful goal and it's what we pray for to live in that that's that life of that high spirit and it's it's our we must we strive to do it it's not always easy and there are times when peace and kindness and goodness like this week seem very far away but god tells us that they're there and we continue to strive to live in that manner if we live by the spirit let's follow the spirit let's not become arrogant make each other angry or be jealous of each other so we are freed from the law we're freed from the letter of the law but that freedom takes us into the spirit of the law and into a life of in relationship with god which is given to us not by our own striving or by our own uh, deeds or our our own money or whatever is given to us by the grace of God. And we live always in the grace of God, in the Spirit, in relationship with God. Let's bow our heads and say a prayer on this beautiful Monday, Sunday morning. Heavenly Father, help us to live with each other in kindness and gentleness and patience and goodness. Help us to understand and live in response to the grace and the beauty that you have given to us. We do right things, Lord. We do, we do good things, not because we must, but because we may and because we are responding to your grace. Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day weekend, as we remember the sacrifice of so many for us through the, the years of our country's history, help us to be grateful for those men and women. Help us to remember what they did. And help us to live in a way that is worthy of them and their sacrifice and of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.